Welcome to the first Lone Star Elixir. You had a warm up now, right? Okay. <laughs> It's really exciting to be here back at the Norris Conference Center in beautiful Austin, Texas. If you don't know this already, Texas is the only place big enough to hold this much elixir. <laughs> Texas is also the only place big enough to, to hold the entire Earth. It's a fact. However, the only thing that Texas is not big enough to hold is this audience, all eight billion of you. <laughs> it it goes, goes for miles. And now that I'm here, I'm actually here to be able to talk about building devices. Uh, I do a little project called Nerves, and since I'm uh, building devices, uh, I am the only man who dare give you the Raspberry Pi at Lone Star. I really tried hard to make that one work. <laughs> Oh, before we jump into some device making stuff, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the great accomplishments and the reasons why everybody's actually here. Uh, the number of packages available in Hex, as we can see here over the course of the year, growing from 2014 to 2015 to 2016. I have a tiny little sliver of it in 2017. It's not that impressive. It's just started. So I kept that one out. Uh, we can also see here number of package downloads that we have in Hex. And this is a really tall graph. If you can see that little sliver there in 2014, it just scales upwards massively. So the community is growing. So much so that the NERVS project, uh, which actually just started getting a lot of great leverage, uh, the package, when I asked for those statistics uh, from Eric, from Hex, I said, hey, let me know how many downloads the NERVS project had last year this time. He goes, there wasn't a NERVS package last year at this time. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, one of my fun little statistic brag slides here. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited with uh, this uh, here. We've crossed over the 10,000 downloads mark for the package in less than a year. And uh, one of my uh, favorite parts about that is uh, that puts us at the 310th package for downloads in the top 8%. All right. But really, the reason that we're all here is because we decided to rally around great tools to build some great software. We all decided that we want to be able to use Elixir for creating uh, amazing new experiences like uh, customer-facing websites, uh, uh, some uh, elastic middleware that can really perform, and uh, also devices using the NERVS project. So when working through these, I I looked at all the other stuff. I looked at, uh, I, I took inspiration from as many places as I could, um, most of which, in case, were from Phoenix for this talk. Um, because uh, when developing devices using nerves, it should be really comfortable. And up until now, there's been some sort of disconnects that's been happening. Uh, the hardware wasn't really always accessible. And in the case of programming on Elixir, you feel comfortable and confident on your host environment, on your laptop, because you can just hammer away code and try it out, and if it doesn't work, everything's fine. So that's why I decided that it's about time that we tried to address this. And I put together a talk today that I'm going to be talking about called King of the Hill, most appropriately displayed right here. And for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, uh, I dropped an L off of there because in the hardware world, King, uh, Hill is, means hardware in the loop. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to be able to bring the hardware closer to your uh, host machine to be able to make it so that you can have that faster iteration, that faster debugging, uh, and not have to wait, um, you know, the tragedy of, of seconds to be able to get to your, uh, it adds up after a while, it does, it gets monotonous. For those of you don't, who don't know me, my name is Justin Schneck. I develop hardware and hardware accessories. Uh, I work for a company called Latote, and uh, I, uh, uh, we're, we're hiring, actually. Uh, we're always looking for people to join us in the uh, beautiful area of San Francisco. <laughs> it's not far from here. <laughs> Probably get a plane. Uh, yeah, but with Latote, I really need to thank these, uh, this company. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with some of the uh, smartest, funniest, uh, not as good looking as me kind of people. Um, but 
it's been a wonderful experience. And without them, we wouldn't have been able to get nerves to even to where it is now. Uh, so uh, with where we're at, we're at a 0.4 release right now. And that includes uh, some great additions from the last time I spoke about this. Um, I believe the last time I spoke was in uh, Elixir Conf in uh, Orlando, and we talked about what was going to be shipping. Well, then is now. We have a new feature that, we're uh, that we have out right now. It's called the Docker Provider. And uh, the Docker Provider basically allows you to, uh, on your Mac or Windows machine, maybe, um, untested, see me afterwards if you can't get it working. <laughs> I need one of you. <laughs> uh, you can actually use Docker to be able to produce the Linux uh, user land pieces, the, uh, the actual Linux machine that's uh, going to wrap your code and distribute it out onto the devices. Um, up until now, this was sort of something that you could only do on a Linux host. And so instead of uh, uh, only being able to do it on your Linux host, now at this point you can actually um, uh, run it on your Mac. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, released global artifacts. That's for hex packages. Uh, and this was a fun one and an important one, I felt, because um, when it came to uh, running NERVS projects, for every single project that you had, uh, you have to download a system and a tool chain. The system can sometimes weigh upwards of, uh, you know, 100 to 120 megabytes. Uh, and the tool chain could be 80 to 150. And uh, that was not only per project, that was per environment. So you run in dev, then you run in test, then you run in prod, now you're up to half a gigabyte worth of stuff to be able to produce a system that can run on this tiny little SD card for some reason. So all of those things add up after a while, and well, we decided that for stuff that we trust that we can compute compu uh, the actual hashes for, we're gonna globalize that. And we're gonna make it so that it downloads it to a shared location in your home directory uh, that you can actually go back and clean out later. And then the reason that we could do that is because we were able to uh, 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 synchronize everything up. Uh, we had several packages that have been, uh, become deprecated now. Uh, the uh, NERVS system package and the NERVS toolchain package, they both contain their own compilers. And it's, as it turned out, those compilers were basically the same. So uh, we've uh, sort of made everything now uh, moved upwards into uh, the uh, NERVS package. There's a lot of them when you look at there. The, the main top one uh, has this package compiler now. So um, we, can, we can have everything sort of point to all the same versions. Everything's in sync. Everything's nice and compact. Uh, and uh, everything moves quickly, also because we were able to dump XRM and move to distillery really fast. All right, so what do we need to do to be able to do hardware in the loop? Uh, so this is sort of what, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, what does it mean for nerves to have hardware in the loop? Uh, we're also going to talk about the changes that were required in nerves to be able to get uh, to accomplish this task. Uh, and then in addition, I'll show you a cool demo. Uh, I'm excited for the demo. It's really cool. <laughs> so as I said before, we took a lot of inspiration from different places. And one of the places we looked at was Phoenix Reload. And in the case of Phoenix Reload, you have a pretty uh, easy mechanism. Uh, you have a browser, and then you know, on the back end, you have your uh, a terminal window. And, uh, and what you do is you, you press reload on your web page, and then uh, that sends a request to the, to the, uh, to the running beam. And if the running, the running beam, what it does is it, it checks to see if there's any code changes on the files. And, and if, it, if there are, then it recompiles the, uh, the, the modules. Uh, and then uh, if everything's cool, then it sends the request back to the browser. And the browser's like, hey, here's your new stuff. And you're like, this is awesome. Where has this been my whole life? So uh, Phoenix Reload also, uh, the code reloader features in Phoenix also has this uh, ability of handling errors pretty well because of its uh, uh, ability to, to keep the VM running and in a state where it tries to compile it. Um, if you same way, try to be able to reload a site, and it says it fails. Well, then it just gives you this pretty looking error page that says stuff went wrong. And then you go on your way, and you're like, I fixed it. Yay. And you don't have to do any more work. And it's great. Now, the issue is here that we can't just be like, oh, let's just take what Phoenix did and like, you know, just apply it right to what NERVS needs to do. There was a little bit more work that needed to be done. 
Um, here's an example of which. Well, we have disconnected pieces. Uh, you have your host computer, let's say that's this terminal window on the, uh, on the left here, and then you have some device, the Raspberry Pi, Google and Black, whatever, over here on the, on the right side. And that device, uh, it, it, it might have some connections that is being made to some accessories. Uh, you probably are doing something interesting with it, and it's not just sitting there computing stuff, because we have much more powerful computers to be able to just sit and do computation. Um, it's probably connected to some sensors or uh, some displays or other devices. And so in this situation, when we would want to be able to reload code, uh, we would actually be synchronizing the state of two different virtual machines. And inevitably then, the code that's being used to run on the target, um, typically in the case of NERVS devices, has a PID, uh, uh, it has um, a processes uh, that are running uh, port drivers or uh, interfacing with some low-level C code. And uh, that, that port driver, that C code, needs to be reinitialized so that it can uh, 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 utilize the new code paths that are on, uh, present. So what we need to do is, on the remote machine, we basically need to tell it to reinitialize the application stack. And if everything's cool, then, you know, we'll just send a message back to the terminal. No big deal, we'll just synchronize two VMs. The problem in this case, though, is that if everything is not good, then we're left in a situation where uh, when restarting uh, the application stack, you're sort of uh, restarting the initialization procedure. And if the initialization procedure fails, then the VM fails, then the network fails, and you're basically left with this equaling this. <laughs> it's not a good state to be in. Um, we want to try to eliminate the need for SD card swapping, and in this case, you're going to have to go get the SD card out of the box and then plug it in your computer and reburn it, and that's fine for somebody like yourselves, but maybe not for an engineer in the field or a, a customer. So we decided that there's three different areas that we need to be able to focus on to be able to make this robust enough to work. Uh, we have a section of host tools that are required, uh, that need to run locally on your host development machine. We need stability in the network because we thought about this one for a while. We, we thought, um, you know, what's the way that we can uh, uh, connect these devices the easiest? Well, Erlang is beautiful for Erlang distribution protocol. We can just strap together these nodes and then everything's going to be great. We can make RPC calls. Everybody's got the network. Not everybody has these, uh, like a spy bus or or UARTs and they're slow, so make, uh, uh, we'll just uh, have a really solid network. Uh, and then a set of target tools that needs to be on the target to allow us to do some uh, uh, error handling, so that way we don't you know, turn into the brick state. So this journey sort of unfurled into this magical web of mystery, uh, and let me take you down that chaotic path. And let's start with some of the target tools. Because some of the things that I discovered while building this were pretty interesting. So the target requires us to be able to uh, do a couple things. We need to be able to always boot. All right, now, uh, what this means is like with NERVS, when you build a release, when you build firmware on your machine, you're building an OTP release. And when, the, uh, when you plug that SD card into your NERVS, device into like your Raspberry Pi, and it starts up, basically, um, it starts uh, Linux, and then Linux starts a little shim program called Erl init that knows how to be able to start Erlang, and then Erlang goes through its initialization procedure, and then your application's running. The mantra of NERVS is that we want you to spend as most of your time inside of the VM as possible, because there's no better place on these machines to run than in that VM. I mean, uh, we get a lot of help from Linux on the outside world, but for the most part, you'll be more comfortable by staying inside the virtual machine. So in addition to always being able to boot that initialization procedure that happens, uh, you'll know that if you try to fire up a machine on your, on your uh, uh, you try to fire up code on your local machine that fails initialization, it crashes the VM, and then that's the brick state. If we crash the VM on the target, we've basically crashed the OS, 
And if we have no OS that's running and we're not rebooting, then we're just sitting there with nothing and no ability to talk to it. In addition, uh, it's important that in, uh, by passing the initialization, that, that if we were to restart services, that we, that we make sure that critical services stay alive, like networking. So that way we can always continue to communicate with it. And then the last thing that we need on the target is some helpers and some abilities for us to be able to sync code and priv files. Now, we went down a couple different paths with this that were cool. One of which uh, Francesco mentions inside of his new book uh, that talks about using a code server. And uh, there's actually, Erlang has the ability of saying like, oh, I've got these two VMs. I'm gonna make this one a, a code server, and then there's these other VMs that are gonna connect to it, and they're gonna get all their code from it. And it, and it was a really promising looking thing for being able to use for debugging. Unfortunately, it doesn't handle priv files. So when it comes time for you to try to load a port or a NIF or some sort of file that lives in the priv folder of your, uh, uh, of your uh, application, uh, it would be looking in a path that doesn't exist because the path would be that of the one on the actual code server. So we had to decide of going on a different way here. We needed to be able to sort of scaffold something from the ground up. So in this case, I looked for more inspiration. Well, what does a regular system boot sequence look like when you turn your laptop on? Or when you turn a Raspberry Pi on and boot into Linux? So you've got this tiny little shim program that's called a bootloader. The bootloader lays down just enough train track in front of yourself to be able to know how to be able to boot into the Linux kernel. And then that knows how to be able to lay just enough more track down to be able to get to the point where it can start booting your applications and doing something interesting. This is pretty much how most of our computer systems all work today. So that's the interesting part. Well, I knew it there. I needed a bootloader. We gotta shim the VM so that we have control over bypassing the default behaviors of the Erlang initialization sequence. So this led down a path of trying to be able to break apart and understand how releases work. This is where things got a little bit more interesting. So some of you may or may not be familiar with how an actual OTP release gets put together or what the pieces and components of it actually are. But essentially what happens is when you start Erlang on the other side, you pass it a boot file. And that boot file is a series of instructions that tells the VM where to find assets and what to start, what, pro what applications to start as part of the initialization sequence. So to, to make a boot file, you need to do a couple things. You need to start with a rel file. So this is a sample rel file. This is something that you can pretty much easily put together. Um, all it is is it's, a, uh, it's actually a four, a four tuple, yeah. Um, the first part being the atom release, and this is an Erlang uh, syntax because all the rel files are just the uh, Erlang terms. Uh, it starts with a release atom, and then you tell it what the application is, which is its own two tuple with the version. You tell it what version of the Erlang runtime you're gonna be using for it and it should look for. And then you pass it as the last parameter, a list of applications and their start types. So when building bootloader, what we knew we needed to do was during the process that we create an OTP release, in addition to creating the rel file that distillery will make for you that knows how to automatically bring up your application in a default state, we're gonna make another one called the bootloader rel file. That in this case, um, this continues by the way, I chunked this off a little because it's quite long. Um, in this case, uh, our rel file, um, it, uh, it, it knows just enough, it loads just enough applications to be able to get a usable system running and itself and then all of the rest of the applications and the third parameter here, this is the start type, it just says don't start this application but what that does is it automatically wires all the code paths for us so that it's available for us to start. So we tricked the, rel, the, the, the release system into being able to produce this bootloader uh, uh, rel file. And then using this, you can, you can then pass it to the sysfs tools and say, take this rel file, make me a start script. And then that produces this massive amount of output. I mean, this is like super truncated right here. Um, it's just this never ending file of, of uh, instruction after instruction after instruction that basically one at a time gets fed into the, uh, into the uh, uh, init system and then just brings up the machine uh, uh, um, during that sequence. And the reason for all of this insanity is because we need to ensure that the initialization sequence always passes. 
And then once we know that it always passes and we boot to the bootloader, then the bootloader's responsibility is to triage any errors that we get from then on. But as long as that initialization passes, we're good. So we want to make sure that we have the, mo the minimum amount of code in place that is pristine and, and working. So here's some information on how to make those files. As part of uh, distillery, you can actually use the uh, mix release utils right term. Um, we put a couple PRs out uh, to be able to uh, open up some of the stuff in distillery so that we can start leveraging it as well. Um, and then the deeper level call, once you have a rel file, which is uh, um, that first one, then you can just pass it to SysTools, tell it to make a script. And then that script basically gives you both the script and the binary version of it, which is the one that you pass to uh, the uh, initialization command. So we shim this easily with uh, using a plugin. Um, you can see down here for uh, distillery, this is a uh, configuration file for distillery. Uh, all we do is we just say, hey, when you're running your release, uh, I want you to execute the bootloader plugin. And then what bootloader does is it uh, generates those files so that you can use it. You can use this with or without nerves. It doesn't matter. Uh, this isn't a nerves specific thing. Um, it's uh, uh, supposed to be a little bit broader. And then now we're left with this. We have a VM that's, that boots to the bootloader, and then we use the bootloader to boot our applications. So the second part of bootloader is that it, it handles code updating for us. We put some helper files and functions in to be able to do the stuff where we're talking about uh, synchronizing the important pieces, modules, applications, and priv files. And so how we do this is we have some functions. We, we have an application controller, and uh, that loads all the applications that it knows about. And you just say, hey, application controller, give me a hash. And the hash is essentially it's, it's a, a hash of all of the hashes of all of the important files. And so that way we know with just one little cache line, did anything change? If something changed, since, we're on, uh, since in NERVs we're on a read-only file system, we want to be able to do something that we're calling applying an overlay. So instead of just loading these new modules, uh, what we want you to do is uh, we want you to execute a strategy where you write the files over to this read-write partition because the ones that you have are read-only. And then we want you to update the code paths so that when you apply the overlay, that's going to just go and lay on top of it. So then we prepend the code paths so that when it goes looking for the modules and the priv files, it'll find them there first. And if it doesn't find them, because we're only putting in a partial fragment of an overlay, it falls through to the old ones. That way we can then reversion our stuff over and over again we can reload the applications, and then everything's back to where we were. So the second component of this, right? now we have the target in place. We can update it. We can keep it running. The second component of this, a steady network. Well, when I got to this step, I thought to myself, how hard could this be? It's networking. <laughs> and then I remembered, oh, there's a package called interim Wi-Fi. Yeah, no, not interim Wi-Fi. As a matter of fact, it just so happens that the interim part of the interim Wi-Fi package meant that it's still being worked on, not the matter of that on the Raspberry Pi 3 that you see here. It only works an interim amount of times. Like, I had two boards from two different manufacturers, both Raspberry Pi 3, and one of the two of them uh, would, would uh, uh, when booting, bring up the Wi-Fi uh, properly, load the, the Wi-Fi stack properly, one out of five times. The other one, zero out of five times. Yeah, I caught wind that in the channels we have uh, for support that people were saying that they just essentially tell their customers to keep plugging it back in until it works. Uh, I mean, even Windows, you only have to reboot three times to get it to work, right? <laughs> All right, so here's a Yak. Here's a Raspberry Pi 3. Here is... Uh, me fixing Wi-Fi. <laughs> so there's this term I learned recently called yak shaving. Uh, you're probably familiar with it. If you're not, basically the idea of yak shaving can be summarized in this statement. Uh, I said this, now here I am recompiling GCC on my Mac just so I can burn an SD card, so I can test out the new Linux kernel, so I can see if Wi-Fi might work better. Yeah, it's a series of tasks, essentially, that lead you to the point where you're like, I just wanted to do this thing over here, and now all of a sudden I'm shaving a yak. I don't understand how I got here. So as a nice response, Lance says to me, 
the irony of this fact is that uh, I'm probably the person that he'd most, vote most likely to shave a yak at any time and of any size. <laughs> that was pretty funny until I had the sad realization that working in hardware is kind of like that. <laughs> so I'm putting my entry in for the Elixir yearbook, most likely to shave a yak. So what did this problem turn out to be? Well, I, we investigated it for a while. We tried to update the Linux kernel. Essentially what happens is the Broadcom module, we were compiling into the Linux kernel. There's two ways that you can run module, uh, Linux modules. You can compile them into the kernel, or you can compile them as a module, and then you can just load them in at runtime. Apparently, uh, uh, the Broadcom module doesn't like to be compiled into the kernel, and that our tests showed that when running against Raspbian, even Raspbian doesn't have it compiled into the kernel, probably for you know, portability sake, but uh, in their case, they're just doing a mod probe on start, and mod probing it on start seems to yield the results that it always works. So, problem solved. We're gonna pull the Broadcom module out of there, and this whole experiment, because I was looking for like toys to play with, you know how you do development, right? You're like, oh, I need a little pet project I can build so that it'll drive me to building this feature, got me one step closer to ice cold beer in my, in my kegerator so that I could monitor the temperature and have a beer. I needed it after this. The path was getting deep. I figured, oh, one yak's not enough, let's shave more. On top of that, we decided that interim Wi-Fi was too interim-y and uh, it needed to have some things go. Here's a PR that we just merged recently to rip Genevent out and replace it with registry. So another thing, next version of NERVS, 1.4 plus on Elixir, yeah. Cutting edge, that's how we like it. <laughs> uh, registry was needed because we, we wanted a consumable way to be able to monitor event changes in interfaces, like when an interface running DHCP gets a new IP address. In that case, we wanted the ability for the uh, IP address change to affect the name of the VM. So the strategy is that you register for uh, uh, notifications on the network interface. Uh, you'll receive DHCP events as they come in. When that DHCP event says that the interface address changed, you bring net kernel down, you bring it back up with the new name, and now all of a sudden you have an addressable node again. So now we fixed the network. Things are getting better. We're finally getting towards the end of this path. And the last piece left that I wanted to show you here on this case was some of the, the work that we've done on the host tools. So, the host is a tricky place, the laptop that you're running on. And at this point in the equation, I started to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I had working tests that I could actually code, make code changes on the, on the remote uh, 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 device with, with bootloader and I had a network that could get me there to do it. Now at this point it was ready, I was like, all right, now I can start pulling pieces of inspiration in from Phoenix, and I can take a look at what they're doing with the monitoring systems, and so I brought in FS. And the idea here was that we need to know, we need to look at all the, the source files that are on your machine uh, for the different applications that you're running, um, including some of the dependencies that are path-based, because if you're an umbrella, well, you want to monitor those too. So we brought in FS uh, into a project that we're calling the NERVS reactor. And uh, FS is just told to monitor all these files, including the priv directory files. And then whenever it receives a change, then it just says, hey, try to compile it, much like how Phoenix works. And in theory, this all works fine. In reality, you're running underneath a host environment that is always being compiled for the target. So here I am, I'm ready to be able to test this out, I'm ready to see the fruit of my labor, and, and all of a sudden then it says, FS kicks me back an error that says, um, what native interface for Mac are you talking about? I'm running on Linux. <laughs> nope, doesn't work. <laughs> so what's the reason for this? Well, I've said this in the past, Nerves-based projects will always compile for the target. And the reason that that decision was laid down that way is because it's very important that the environments don't get mixed up throughout the mix lifecycle because Nerves does so much to be able to patch the lifecycle so that it can 
find the right cross compilers so that your machine can produce code for what it thinks is a Linux machine or a target that's of a different architecture. And this is past Justin saying this. So now I'm saying, eh, it'll sometimes compile it for the target. <laughs> this is a change that we had to make, a realization that I've come to. Um, and uh, to do this, uh, we're sort of taking the step into the next level of adding a, a second layer, an additional layer of mix-ins for configurations in addition to mix-end, which we're, gonna, we're, we're, uh, we're hiding, uh, hooking onto called mix-target. Here's a pull request. <laughs> it's still open. Making this change isn't uh, a slight easy move, actually. Uh, making this change will actually uh, impact a lot of documentation and a lot of functionality. Um, primarily, what does this look like from the outside in? Well, our new project generator, uh, mixnerves.new, it always took a target at the end because we always needed to know what you're most interested in compiling for because host wasn't an option. So you'd say, oh, uh, my default target for this application is going to be a Raspberry Pi 3. And then it would st uh, structure your application so that you could, you'll always by default be, be compiling for Raspberry Pi 3, so all your mix commands would just always be in that environment. Now, the change, this is before, this is after. Well, you no longer in the new project generator coming out need to be able to specify the target because we're going host first in this case. A complete 180. And now all of the default mix commands that you run, just like you would with any other application and any other project, will compile for your host machine first. And then if you want to be able to produce firmware, or produce a, uh, an output for a different target, like a Raspberry Pi 3, you'd pass in mix target and let the system know that you're interested in moving the uh, to the different environment. So in the, the main component of this, the most interesting part of this switch actually is this section right here. This is inside of the mix file that gets generated. <coughs> this is where we um, define our aliases. Uh, and in the case of mix, there's nothing magical about it. All of the aliases are declared inside of the file so that things are explicit. These are what we do in the case of uh, compiling for a, uh, uh, any target, this says. But now in the new project, in the case of the host, we're saying don't invoke the, mix, uh, the nerves environment as part of the, the mix lifecycle. Uh, we want to actually compile for the host. Now this introduces a, a couple different interesting pieces though. In the case of nerves projects, since there's a lot of times that you're including applications uh, like, um, uh, let's say, uh, Elixir Ale, for example, which is a, uh, an application library written by Frank Hunleth uh, that uh, knows how to be able to interface with uh, GPIO pins, like twiddling pins for, uh, uh, that are on like a Raspberry Pi or a piece of hardware that aren't necessarily available on your Mac. That application on your Mac will not compile unless it's compiling underneath the NERVS environment through the target. Well, if you were to, let's say, design your application so that as part of the start sequence of your application, you wanted to also start Elixir Ale and start twiddling some sort of pins, well then, if you tried to run that in, I, in an IEX session on your host, it would crash. So another change we're making is we're, we're defining multiple pathways to be able to start the application. In the case of starting on a target, you'll be able to define a uh, a, a starting point for the application, and then that way that'll be able to bring up all the target-specific stuff, and if you're starting on the host inside that project, you'll be able to define either nothing or an additional pathway. Let's say if you want to be able to stub out some things and mimic some of the functionality that Elixir Ale might provide, because you want to execute some unit tests. Another thing that we didn't have before. Yay! <laughs> So here we are, the path is getting longer. And I'm getting weary. Because up until now, on my path to being able to do hot code reloading, I've been doing SD card swapping. Now we have something in place that allows us to be able to do full remote firmware updates. Uh, it's uh, nerves under firmware under HTTP. It lets you push firmware updates over the uh, uh, HTTP. But up until now, the only way to be able to do it would be to be able to like, hack together some sort of curl command on your machine or uh, others in the community would write some lightweight mix tasks that would in themselves hack together a curl command on your machine. 
But the beautiful part is now everything just unfurled. We see that we have the ability, I can run any utility I want on my machine as part of a NERS project now that can complement the actual target. So now at this point when bringing in uh, NERVS uh, firmware over HTTP, uh, we introduced a, uh, a new step called firmware push. And running on your local machine, you'll be able to say, Bix firmware push to this device, this, this target. And what it does in the background is it compiles a firmware package, which is an OTP release, and the entire Linux operating system changes. And it gives you nice, beautiful progress bars inside of the window that you're in and then applies the change and reboots the device on the other end. So, here's a yak. Here's mix firmware push. <laughs> yak shaved. This is what that command looks like, by the way. Um, you have a couple different options, you can see, uh, that you can say uh, whether or not you want it to reboot on the other end when it's finished, uh, where the actual target is, and you can actually point it to the firmware. You have to pass either target or firmware. Um, you can, if you pass target, then it'll uh, discover where the firmware is based off of the, uh, uh, the mix file itself. Um, if you pass firmware, then you can just arbitrarily send it to whatever FW file you have on your machine. It doesn't even have to be for that device. You'll find out later. <laughs> so that's what that command looks like when you go to run it. Uh, you just point it at uh, a place on the internet and um, WAN, LAN, whatever, it'll just try its best to be able to get there. Best part about this is it's uh, begrudgingly written using HTTPC, so there's no additional dependencies on your machine. It uses all the built-in stuff that's inside of the Erlang VM on your, on your uh, uh, host computer. So here we are now, back to the point where we can execute code. I'm happy again. I can push firmware. I don't have to SD card swap anymore. Let's get this done. So the next step, well, from learning my lessons with HTTP, uh, for, with firmware push, I found that uh, there's a little trickery that's involved in uh, starting in one mix environment. Uh, I, I, that's probably not the right term to use there. I should say um, bringing up the mix application with one set of configuration parameters, like mix environment is dev and mix target is host. And then tricking it so that you can say, Bring yourself back up again, but I want you to be mix environment is dev and mix target is uh, Raspberry Pi 3. And uh, doing that in a way that's proper, uh, we needed some hygiene here. So what we're doing is uh, there's, some, there's some funny business happening behind the scenes. Um, and instead of doing it inside of the pristine session that you're running in, we wrap it all in a, in a uh, transient VM and we say, hey, you, decorate yourself like this and we're gonna tell you when we need stuff from you. So here we are. We're back to the point where we've got a running reactor, we've got a stable network, and we've got a working bootloader and a big pile of yak hair. <laughs> Let's see how this works. So um, up here I have, uh, uh, I have a Raspberry Pi Zero connected with just a USB cable, giving it power. Uh, and it's, uh, it's running bootloader right now. So it's waiting for some instructions. And I have this uh, uh, example application that I'm going to mirror my displays with now so that you can see it, because it would be a really bad demo if I can see it, but you can't. All right, let's do a little fun window treatment here. You're a little big. Everybody can make fun of me later for not having a window manager. If you find one that works nicely, let me know. I know you have opinions on this, Chris. <laughs> All right, so let me tell you what we have going on here. Uh, the top right here, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the top left is uh, just my console window. I'm sitting inside of a, uh, a regular uh, project. That's uh, this project here I'm calling the Pi Reactor. All right, and on the bottom left here, I have um, the serial console of the IEX session that's actually running on this device. So on this device, I can do things like, um, hey, Pi Reactor, do you have a hello function? Oh, it's undefined. No, you don't. Okay. So. 
Um, first, let me show you some of the new setup pieces, and we'll look at the mix file first that I, uh, I talked about. Um, this is part of the change that we made. We can see here now that we're going host first uh, as our default for mix target. Um, we're adding in some additional pathways. Like I said, we're changing aliases on target now, uh, which down here uh, decides whether or not we want to invoke the NERVS environment. And then we're also uh, splitting our dependencies. Uh, when we get to depths, we have, these are the shared dependencies that will be existing on both my host and any target I run on, plus the dependencies of any target. In the case of Raspberry Pi Zero, I'm including the Raspberry Pi Zero system and NERVS networking, because uh, I don't need to use NERVS networking to bring up the network on my local computer. Um, and then any other target, we're gonna, this is just some magic here where we're saying if you pass something other than Raspberry Pi Zero, uh, just go fetch the system for it and whatever. We'll try our best. So uh, the other additional changes, like I said, this is where we split the code paths. So that way if I try to uh, uh, open up an IEX session, um, I can actually boot into a, a working VM. And it didn't try to be able to bring up uh, some specific stuff, like what's happening in this application here. Just take a peek at that. Um, it's trying to fire up the initialized network worker which would actually try to start configuring a DNS uh, mask on it to be able to start a DNS server. Probably is not gonna work too well on my Mac, uh, at least in this configuration. Um, so, all right. And then some additional stuff that I'm doing. Uh, this stuff is all in the documentation. You can pass in your own uh, an URL init commands so that we can uh, change the serial ports. Uh, and uh, uh, we're doing some other configuration stuff, like we're telling bootloader uh, where, uh, which application we're interested in running and where we should store overlays on the target. In this case, the, uh, on, on uh, NERVS devices, the default place for read-write partition, the app data partition, is, at, is mounted at forward root. So we're saying uh, make a directory called URL overlays and put the stuff there. And then we're just configuring some static networking and we're telling uh, uh, when, we, when we build firmware to include our own root FS addition so that we have this custom uh, boot command. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at how some of this fun stuff works. So here I am in an IEX session. I'm gonna start the reactor uh, and tell it that it should interface with this remote node. And now here we are, as I said, in a, uh, a new session. Um, with some, you know, don't mind that. That's the uh, man behind the curtain right now. Uh, uh, we've got a, a connection to that session, and now this is uh, fully fired up and wired and ready to go. So if I, if I call this command, we can see, oh, it doesn't exist. But, you know, now that we're, we're live programming, let's go and check it out. Let's go into the PyReactor module here, and let's say, uh, def, hello, do, And we'll hit, we'll hit save, uh, it'll synchronize an overlay, and all of a sudden now, we've got Hello World. As I said, the nice part about this is the portability aspect, that it's, it's really small fragments that get sent over. Uh, all that actually happened in this overlay is that it ended up transferring this modified module uh, that it needed to be able to apply on the other end. And if we take a look here, we'll see at uh, uh, the root overlays? I think it's overlays, yeah. Uh, there's a directory's worth of different overlays that have been applied during the life cycle of this application. And some might cancel out others. So in our case, we can say, uh, okay, I don't want hello world, I, I wanna go back to the, to the old way of doing things, I just don't want anything at all, and when I hit save, it'll synchronize a new overlay. Now that doesn't work anymore. Uh, things are really fast, it's great. It's almost as if it's right there on your machine. Uh, it's the speed of your network. And the beautiful part about this is that even though this uh, Raspberry Pi Zero just so happens to be connected physically to my laptop, doesn't mean that it actually has to be physically connected to my laptop. Since this runs over the network, this Raspberry Pi, I could be remote debugging it and it could be in the closet in the next room over. The only thing that you're not gonna get right now is this serial console output that I'm getting, unless you're also rem shelled in, which you can do because you're not bringing down the VM on the other side. You're only interacting with the boot layer, uh, bootloader shim. 
So let's take a look at uh, the other piece, the interim uh, piece. Uh, now that we're doing our rem remote debugging is over and we have our, our, uh, our uh, thing in production, we can see here we have, uh, uh, no, uh, we have nothing to find. Let's kill the reactor and let's uh, define a new thing here, def. Uh, foo var, reactor's not running, code did not get synchronized. Uh, but let's say we're uh, in more of a production state. We want to start pushing stuff out. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, set my mix target and compile some firmware. It's a little faster than SD card swapping, huh? <laughs> Still not as fast as the reactor. Uh, once it's done creating our entire Linux image and firmware, now that we have the firmware file, uh, we're gonna, in the host, from the host environment, not setting mix target, uh, we're gonna tell it that we wanna execute a firmware push because we need that code to be able to, to run on our host. We need it to be compiled for our host. And we're gonna pass it the, uh, some of the default parameters here and we'll say, uh, we'll say reboot too. Now what this just did is something that you would this, there's a combination of events here that you're gonna be using. See, the NERVS reactor is good when you wanna be able to do code changes in Elixir. And like I said, we would like it if you could spend as much of your time as possible inside of the VM because it's a nice place to be. But let's say that there's a situation where you need to be able to add some sort of Linux land user process uh, that you didn't have on the, on the machine before. So you'd end up changing some configurations You'd use the Docker provider to be able to produce a new Linux image. It would take a while. And then once you're done pro, uh, uh, building your new Linux, Linux image that has all your uh, other user land functions in it, um, you'll marry that to your, Elixir or to your Elixir code. And then you'll need to push that firmware to your device as something new. And you can do that by putting the SD card in your computer and reburning the entire SD card, but you'll lose all of the contents of your app data partition um, unless you run an upgrade task. But you know, by default, you'll lose the, it'll just flash it all. So as I said, there's, uh, you're gonna use complementing pieces of, of these uh, tools to be able to, to work for uh, debugging. In this case, the reactor won't be able to synchronize user land programs and applications because it's outside the VM. To do that, you would need to push uh, a new user space to it, a new Linux kernel uh, or uh, any other Linux land uh, uh, applications. And with firmware push, we can do that. Um, what it's doing is actually it's, uh, it's loading the firmware onto the device and it's streaming the firmware into the B slot and then it uh, boots into the B slot and so your old firmware is actually still left in the A slot. And if it were to fail in the B slot, well you can, you can inside of your application take the necessary precautions to prevent yourself from getting into that dredged brick state um, and uh, then just boot back to the last version. It's good for production not necessarily the best for uh, this situation. So let's see if we've uh, succeeded. So there we go. All right, uh, I'd really like to thank uh, Tim uh, Mecklem. Mecklem? Uh, Tim works for Gaslight. Uh, Tim is the one that, that uh, did all the work necessary to be able to take the Raspberry Pi 3 system image that we provided. And what he did was he got, um, this is uh, running what's known as gadget mode. So it's running as a USB gadget. And uh, that's how over this uh, USB um, uh, interface, I'm getting both serial, an, an additional serial port and a network interface uh, to be able to very, in a very compact way, uh, do the work necessary to show you this today. Um, Tim also got uh, the, uh, uh, what's known as the IOT P hat, or as the kids are saying it, the fat working. Um, which is a, uh, it is a, a, um, a hat for Raspberry Pi Zero that adds Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to it to be able to make it act in, in, uh, more like a, a Pi 3. Um, as I put it, it really gives it a purpose. I mean, <laughs> what are you gonna do with these tiny little devices if they don't have a network connection? Uh, so thank you, Tim, for building that system. If you wanna check it out, uh, there is a, uh, a link down here. You can uh, go to his site. We're, uh, going to be bu building a more official repository to hold uh, all of these community additions that we have. Um, 
In addition to Tim's work, I'd like to be able to say, hooray, we hit 900 people on Slack channel. Yay! Lots of people are starting discussions. Um, it's a little tough to keep up with at times. <coughs> it's um, a lot smaller than the Phoenix channel. Uh, but I'm really proud of the fact that we have so many people in the community who are uh, interested and understanding that the same tools that uh, that they use in their everyday lives that they're interested in, that you guys are here to learn more about, can directly apply to being able to build and tinker with hardware, and, uh, and that it's not that frightening anymore. Once you have the tool set under your belt, it's just a matter of plugging stuff, some stuff in and playing around with it and seeing if it works. There's a lot of great tutorials out there as well uh, that you can be able to get up to speed with, and if you also always have questions, you can just join our uh, NERVS channel. Uh, there's a bunch of great people out there that are putting together stuff. Uh, commercial products at Latote, we're, we're using NERVS, Phoenix, and Elixir to be able to build an incredible stack to be able to uh, uh, automate a lot of the workflows and processes inside of our organization. Now, what's next for the future? Well, uh, we're going to finalize the work on, on mixed target. Uh, I'm hoping to uh, make that more of a uh, household term. Um, and uh, we're going to change our documentation uh, because we're doing that complete about face 180. Uh, makes sense. <laughs> uh, we're going to finalize the work on bootloader and get some more test coverage on that. Uh, writing the test for bootloader to prove that the most early starting replacement to the Erlang initialization system uh, was probably the hardest piece of code that I almost had to work on to date. Um, it's very odd. It spins up a whole bunch of different VMs, and they all kind of talk to each other and shut each other down. And it's, it's like the chaos monkey, I guess, like that, uh, kind of like that. Um, a big thing for me, I want to finish uninteriming networking. Uh, it's a shame that we have that in, in the name of our, uh, uh, our package, but you know, for just cause, networking is hard, and Wi-Fi is a lot harder. And uh, we're looking to be able to ship more, as we're calling it, batteries included systems. Um, the, the goal for NERVS was always to be able to provide and build extremely lightweight, distributable Linux VM, uh, Linux uh, uh, systems that had the Erlang VM and your code inside of it. And so, you know, with, with the minimalistic approach that we have today, we tout the ability of producing uh, 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 systems that are uh, in the megabytes, tens of, like a 10, 10 to 20 megabytes with all your code in it and a full Linux uh, uh, system. Uh, the batteries included systems are going to be the complete opposite of those. They're going to contain almost everything that we can turn on that you're interested in. Um, and uh, keep an eye out for those because uh, we have a lot of people that are working right now on releasing these systems to use for uh, Raspberry Pi uh, uh, WebKit kiosks. So um, there's a lot of projects out there that, that, that are starting to show using the 7-inch Pi Foundation touchscreen displays with the Raspberry Pi on the back to be able to build a kiosk that can leverage Phoenix for its user interfaces. Then you can use Elm, you can use whatever web languages you want. In addition on those battery included systems, we're just gonna be able to turn on a whole bunch of drivers. We're really hoping at that point that we're gonna say, hey, if you're the minimalistic image didn't work for you because your Wi-Fi chip that was built by Joe's computer shop down the street doesn't work, you know, try the batteries included one and, and it's gonna weigh like 200 megs, but you can at least see if it's gonna uh, solve your problem and then and then turn on and off whatever uh, options you need uh, later to save space. So with that, uh, I'm really happy that everybody is here today because this conference proves that we can continue to grow and rally around such awesome tools and that we're all so interested in learning more about what Elixir can provide uh, for us and our businesses. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few questions. Any questions? Hey, I know that you, uh, I think address this on Slack a little bit, but part of the firmware push, um, the security aspect of that, locking that down, making sure that, hey, I'm the right person that can, mm -hmm. can push uh, that up. Yeah, so uh, Garth is currently working on uh, adding in the ability to secure that better with some certificates. Uh, the work there is not done yet, um, but the firmware push mechanism is sort of a, uh, a, a primary step in 
the way of adding a level of, uh, of uh, I trust the network I'm on level of convenience. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, you know, we, are, we are looking to be able to add a higher level of security to that aspect. And uh, I believe we're still at the stage where uh, any level of input from the community would be appreciated and, and you know, we can all open some conversations and talk about what the best way to be able to add that level is that would work for everyone. Any other questions? All right, let's give Justin a big hand. <laughs>